Our scripture today comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the, his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. This is the word of God for you today. And Father, we do ask that you teach us from your word those things you want us to learn and to apply those truths to our life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, today we're going to be looking at the season of temptation. Temptation is man's oldest problem. It's been around since Adam and Eve. And just a, a little poll, how many of you were tempted to stay home in bed today? Okay, I'm going to be honest. Yeah, me too. Okay, um, my wife said I had to come. Okay, um, I want to read you a letter to start off today. Uh, uh, see if you sense the, this writer's struggle with temptation here. This is what the letter said. <clears throat> I'm so full of myself, and what I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way but end up acting another doing the things I absolutely despise. I can't seem to be trusted to figure out what's best for myself and then do it. I need something more. A power within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions. I obviously need help and I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I really can't do it. And when I decide not to do bad, then I do it anyway. My decisions don't result in better actions. Something gets the better of me every time. And it happens so regularly that it's predictable. I tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? Do you sense this writer's frustration uh, in this letter? You can hear uh, in their voice saying, I'm ready to throw in the towel. I, I, uh, and the amazing thing is, this letter was not written by a drug addict on the street. It was not written by a, a prostitute or a pimp or a sexual addict. It was not written by an alcoholic. It was written by St. Paul the Apostle 2,000 years ago. It's Romans chapter 7, basically. You've heard the phrase, I can resist anything but temptation? The fact is we all struggle with temptation, every one of us. Uh, and you'll never be such a great Christian that you uh, stop struggling with it. So today I want to give you six keys from God's word uh, on, on how to handle temptation. So you might want to take notes on this because you're going to need it. Six keys to handling temptation. Number one, anticipate it. I need to anticipate temptation. That means don't be surprised by it. Don't be intimidated by it. Don't be shocked by it. Be prepared. You see, when temptation comes, we usually have uh, three common reactions. The first reaction is shock. We're thinking, oh, how in the world could I have thought a thought like that? And then the next is frustration. Why do I keep falling in this same area over and over again? And the third attitude is discouragement, which says, you know, I'll never change. I can, just, I can never change. I'm just going to be this way forever. 
But you need to understand right up front that it is not a sin to be tempted. Sin is giving in to temptation, not being tempted. You see, you, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair. Those of you who still have hair. Um, and, and you can't stop Satan from bombarding you uh, with ideas, but you can decide uh, not to dwell on them. For instance, have you ever been praying I mean, really sincerely praying. You're, 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 you're really trying to talk to God, and all of a sudden, the most off-the-wall thought comes into your mind. Does that ever happen to you? Am I the only one that thinks like that? Um, I mean, while you're praying, and, and, and you're going, where did that come from? I mean, I can't believe I thought that. And, and we start to get all intimidated oh, I must not be a very good Christian, or maybe I'm not even a Christian at all. Uh, It is not a sin to be tempted. And you will never outgrow temptation. You're you're never going to get to the point in your spiritual life uh, where you go, well, nothing bothers me anymore. You will be tempted. Not because you're evil, but because you're human. You're a human being. Welcome to the human race. It's what you do with temptation that makes it either right or wrong, good or bad. Now, the moment you were saved, the moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ, Satan, like a Chicago hitman, put out a contract on you. You became a target. And he was plotting and scheming 24 hours a day for your downfall. And he's figuring out your vulnerabilities and your weaknesses. And he's figuring out... How am I going to get them to slip? How am I going to get them to make a mistake, to, uh, to fail? And the amazing thing is that if he can't get you to sin, he will just intimidate you uh, with the thought that you might sin. And what he likes to do is, is to make you feel guilty with just a suggestion that you might stumble. And, and he'll come along and say, you know, if you ever got into this situation you'd be a goner. You'd fall. You'd, you'd stumble. Uh, you would deny Christ. You would, you would reject the whole, whole thing and fall flat on your face. And you start getting all uptight and intimidated by, by something that hasn't even happened yet. And that's his goal. Now, what's the antidote? Well, instead of being shocked or intimidated uh, or surprised when Satan puts these thoughts in your mind, you just need to be prepared for them. Look at, look at this verse Jesus said in Matthew twenty six forty one: Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. He says, be prepared, be watching for it, be ready for it. Don't be surprised. Uh, just go, well, I know where that's coming from. It's just the devil again. You see, when God gives us an idea in our mind, we call that inspiration. When Satan gives us an idea, we call that temptation. And you are free to choose which thoughts you dwell on. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, now, is is temptation really a season of life? I mean, it, I mean we have it all the time, Right? Well, yes, you do have it all the time, but there are seasons in your life when you are more vulnerable to temptation than at other times. And this varies with every one of us. Some of you are most tempted when you are bored. Some of you are uh, most tempted when you are lonely. Some when you, uh, when you find yourself uh, very vulnerable, when, you, when you're tired, when you're fatigued. Others when you're under stress. Some of you may be uh, most tempted after a big success. You've you've closed a sale and and, 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 and the lit down after that. Some of you are tempted when you are with uh, friends on weekends. And it just, it it varies with each one of us. So you need to understand the seasons of life that make you vulnerable and you need to be prepared for them and you need to be aware of them. Look at this verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, the Living Bible. If you were thinking, I'd never behave like that, let it be a warning to you, for you too 
they fall into sin. And one of the, the, the seasons where we're most vulnerable, as I mentioned earlier, is, is after a success. Because we think, well, uh, you know, I've got it all together. I'm, I'm spiritually high. And that's when Satan comes and tempts you. So anticipate it. Number two, accept responsibility for it. I need to accept the responsibility for the temptations that occur in my life. Don't blame God. Don't blame other people. Don't blame the devil. Some of you may remember uh, many years ago there was a comedian named Flip Wilson who used to do a routine. He always said, the devil made me do it. Did you know that the devil cannot tempt you without your cooperation? And it's true. Look at this verse in James four, uh, James 1, 14. Temptation is the pull of your own evil thoughts and wishes. These evil thoughts lead to evil actions. If you had no internal desire, um, it couldn't tempt you. Uh, for instance, I have never been tempted to sniff glue. I, I, not once in my life. Why? Because I, uh, the thought of sticking that gooey stuff up my nose just does not appeal to me. Okay? I, I, it just, it, it, it's disgusting. So it never tempted me. But if there were not a corresponding desire in you, you wouldn't be tempted by it. So accept responsibility. Don't blame other people. Don't blame the devil. Just recognize that when you fall into temptation, it's your own fault. Now, this is very important to understand because we live in an age or an era of um, irresponsibility when nobody wants to admit their problems are their own fault. In fact, there, uh, there, there's a bestseller book out called A Nation of Victims, and it says everybody has become a victim, that no problem is ever considered your fault anymore. It's always somebody else's problem. You blame others. You blame the government. You blame uh, the media. We, we blame our parents. Uh, we blame the schools. We blame uh, DNA, our genetics. We, we blame everything. Let me tell you something. Most of my problems I brought on myself. Uh, and that's the truth. And it's true for you too. Most of your problems you really brought on yourself. And you need to accept the responsibility and stop blaming others. You spell blame, be lame. And every time you blame somebody else, you are being lame. You're not admitting what the real problem is. If you're facing a temptation right now, uh, maybe you're facing a secret habit or, or a hang-up or a hurt. Let me say this to you. You are never going to find freedom until you stop fixing the blame and you start fixing the problem. You stop blaming everybody else, uh, even when other people have hurt you. It's your reaction that causes the problem. Uh, your reaction to, uh, your, it's your resentment, your bitterness, uh, your guilt, your anger, your fear, whatever it is, uh, is, is causing the pain to be prolonged. Now, it's amazing to me that some people even try to blame God uh, for the messes in their own life and even for their temptations. Um, and, you know, I, I've heard people say things like, well, you know, God told me to leave my wife and marry this beautiful young chick. And I'm going, w where is that in the Bible? Um, you know, what verse is that? And they say, oh, by the way, we met in church. I'm going, oh, I hope it wasn't UCM. Um, you see, God's will will never contradict God's word. And if God says, no, don't do that in here, <laughs> he will never uh, tell you yes through a feeling. And I don't care how good the feeling is. If God says no, if you listen to your feelings instead of God's word, you're walking straight into a trap. There was a uh, Christian comedian years ago who used to sing a song, it must be the will of the Lord because it feels so right to me. No, no. So one of those common excuses I've heard is, uh, that justifies a whole multitude of sins is, well, God wants me to be happy, and this will make me happy. Yes, God wants you to be happy. That's true. But God wants you to be holy more than he wants you to be happy. He wants you to do what he says, and he wants you to obey him. 
Uh, in fact, you will never be totally happy if you continue to ignore God's will. In, in fact, you're headed for destruction if you do. The rules, the principles in this book are not uh, here to make life miserable. They are here for your own good. They are the path to happiness if you follow him. Uh, and, I, and I tell you, the happiest people in the world are, are people who hang on to God's word and who uh, they do it regardless of what their feelings say. Anytime you ignore this, anytime you, you go after your feelings thinking it's going to make you happy, you're headed for distress, for guilt, for depression, uh, resentment, and, and a host of other emotional hang-ups. And they will trouble you for the rest of your life. You're just asking for trouble. So don't blame God and say, well, he wants me to be happy. Now, just as temptation is as old as Adam and Eve, so is making excuses. But you've got to go further than that. You've got to not just accept responsibility. Number three, you have to ask God for help. That's the third step. You see, God has a 24-hour hotline. Uh, uh, you can call on him anytime. He's willing and, and uh, waiting to help you with any temptation. He's, he's not blown away with it. He, he, he's not, uh, you know, you don't say, God, you just say, God, I'm being tempted by this. And God doesn't go, oh, no kidding. You know, he's not surprised. He already knows what's going on in your life. Uh, and he just wants you to admit it. Uh, now, why don't we ask God for help when we're tempted? There are a couple of reasons. Sometimes we don't ask God for help because we really don't want it, honestly. We want to give in. Um, We know it's wrong. We know it's bad. We we know that we're going to pay for it. We know there's going to be a kickback. But we do it anyway. We want to do it anyway. And, And we're not about to ask God for help because we really don't want his help. So we don't ask. But other times, we really do want his help in a temptation or weakness area, but we don't ask because we're too embarrassed. Uh, Because we keep falling in the same area over and over and over again, and we don't want to come back and say, God, it's me again. Uh, I mean, have you ever felt like that? You, you uh, You just keep falling in the same area, and you're too embarrassed to go back. You say, well, he's already helped me in that area once. I just, I keep falling. I just, I can't go again. Don't ever be embarrassed to ask God for help because God, unlike human beings, has no limit to his patience. It goes on forever and ever. His love is everlasting. His compassion endures forever. So God never gets bored. He never gets impatient. Uh, He never gets irritated when you come to him for help and you say, God, it's me again for the 15th time today. Or maybe maybe for the 200 times a day. And you say, God, I'm being, I'm being tempted. Help, help me. Now, why does God want us to come to him? Because he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the earth. And Jesus went through everything we go through, which means he understands. We have a sympathetic God. He, he knows what you're going through. Look at this verse in Hebrews 4. Jesus had the same temptations we do, though he never once gave in and sinned. So let us come boldly to God and find grace to help us in our times of need. See, we can come boldly boldly without without any hesitation, without any embarrassment, because Jesus sympathizes. He knows exactly uh, what we're going through. He had the same temptations. Well, does that mean Jesus was tempted to lie? Yes. Does that mean Jesus was tempted to exalt himself? Uh, To go on an ego trip? Yep. Does that mean Jesus was tempted to get angry? Yeah. Does that mean Jesus was tempted sexually? Yes. Why? Because he was not only God, he was fully human. And the Bible says he was tempted in every point, just like us. But he didn't give in. And that's the good news. Because because he went through everything that we go through. He can sympathize with us. And, And... And secondly, if he didn't give in, he could always also show us a way to get past it, to to escape uh, without giving in. And that's good news. And we need to call on God for help. 
Many of us don't call on God because we depend on what we call willpower. And we think, oh, I can just tough it out. And, uh, and then willpower uh, will make the day. But willpower doesn't work. Uh, willpower works for a while, but it doesn't work permanently. It's, it's not the permanent solution. Oh, you can, uh, you can tough it out and do this and that, but you, you can say it over and over again. Willpower works for a while, but it's not enough. What you need to do is this third point, call on God for help. You need extra power. Notice this verse, Psalm fifty fifteen. Call to me when trouble comes. You might write out to the side of that verse, this is God's 911. This is, this is the emergency call number. And sometimes when you're facing a temptation, uh, you, know, you know you're going to fall for it. You, you need to send up uh, what I call a microwave prayer. Uh, a microwave prayer is not some long, long drawn out theological fancy term where you go, oh, most gracious heavenly father, giver and provider of all that is good in our life, we thank thee and bless thee for this beautiful provisions you have given to us. No. When you're tempted, you throw up a microwave prayer that goes like this. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Help. Blue, code blue. You know, red alert, SOS. It's not theological, but it works. Uh, let's say uh, you're laying on the beach, men, and they decide to shoot the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition right in front of you. Mayday, mayday. You know? He says, call to me in your times of trouble, and I'll help you. A- anticipate the problem. Accept responsibility. Ask God's help. And number four, admit my struggle to a friend. No, you don't have to admit it to everybody. You don't have to go out and, and blab it to the whole office or go on a, a TV talk show um, and say, here's my secret sin. It means you need to admit it to somebody, a close, a close friend, and it needs to be a Christian. Why? So they can pray for you. I mean, if you, if you, if you admit your sin to an unbeliever, they're just going to laugh at you and go tell 15 other people. But you, you need to tell it to somebody that you trust and, and the... Uh, uh, who will love you and accept you and pray for you. Um, you need to associate with people that can help. Uh, build a support network around you that, for the areas that you're weak in. Uh, you need to reinforce good intentions. There's a story uh, from a pastor uh, in the 19th century who was talking to uh, an Indian chief who had become a Christian. And the chief uh, was talking about the temptations in his mind. And he said it was like two dogs, uh, a good dog and a bad dog, fighting with each other. And uh, the pastor said to the chief, well, which dog wins? And he said, the one I feed. You need to reinforce, feed the good relationships in your life. And you need to de-emphasize and sometimes even cut off bad relationships in your life that are taking you in the wrong direction. The Bible says bad company corrupts good character. And so you need to to make some breaks here and then admit your problem to a close friend who can help you. I know some of you are thinking, you know, I don't need a support group in my life. I I don't struggle with anything. And there's a good Hebrew word for that. Hogwash. The very fact that you're afraid to admit it, that your your weaknesses means that, that the one thing you're struggling with is insecurity. Why? Why do you think people don't want to share their problems with others? They're insecure. It, it comes out in the form of pride. But what is behind pride? Behind pride is a very scared person. Anytime you meet somebody who has to build themselves up over and over, uh, uh, behind that, they are like a little guy in the Wizard of Oz uh, who was, was you know, moving all the things behind the curtain. You pull back the curtain and he's just a little nerd. And you're, you're afraid somebody's going to figure out, you're a nerd. <laughs> you may look like Joe Cool, but inside you feel like a nerd. And, and, and so you, you don't want to admit to anybody that you have weaknesses and, and, and faults and, and your failures, your fears, your feelings, your habits, your hangups. Um, which means all the more you need to do it. The fact is, we all struggle with the exact same temptations. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Remember this. The wrong desires that come into your life aren't anything new and different. 
Many others have faced exactly the same problems before you. We're all in the same boat here because we're all human beings. Now, God wants us to help each other. And he wants us to help each other so much that he has has made a prerequisite to healing, that you share your faults with somebody else. Look at James 5, uh, 16. Admit your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, what I'd like to do is just take five minutes now and have you turn to the person next to you and share your deepest sin. The visitors are getting very nervous about it right now. No, no, I'm just... But notice it doesn't say admit it to a priest or to a pastor, although that can help. Uh, it doesn't say admit it to a counselor, although that can help. It says to each other. And it says, so you may be healed. Don't repress it, confess it. Don't conceal it, reveal it. And he says, get it off your chest, unload it. It is the prerequisite to healing. Hiding a hurt always intensifies it. You know, people says, say, a time heals all wounds. Well, that's a bunch of baloney. If, if time healed all wounds, try sitting in a doctor's office. Would that make you well? No. In fact, time just festers wounds. It, it makes them worse. Time does not heal cancer. Surgery, radiation, or chemo heals cancer. Time will not heal a hurt or that resentment in your life. You need some spiritual surgery on it. You need to, uh, to deal with it dramatically. And the way to do that is by sharing it with a friend who can pray with you and encourage you and counsel you and help you. You know, as a, as a pastor, people uh, tell me all kinds of things. Uh, things that they'll never tell anybody else. I mean, I could blackmail half of you, um, no, no, but I won't. But when somebody comes to me and, and they say, you know, say, you know, Pastor Charlie, uh, and their bottom lip kind of starts to tremble and, and, and their eyes get all misty and their, their face kind of tightens up and, and they say, I've never shared this with anybody else in my life. And when someone says that, I I can get sort of excited because I know that relief is about to happen. Um, They are taking the first step to recovery. The door is going to be open. The light is going to be turned on. The boogeyman is going to be exposed uh, for who he is. And they're going to experience for the first time in their life uh, relief because they shared their deepest secret with another human being. That's the way God set it up in the world. Uh, Confess your faults to each other. Pray for each other so that you will be healed. And and I know that relief is on the way before they can even tell me what it is uh, because they're already starting the healing process by their willingness uh, to do that. This is what God is saying. You are not going to get well on your own. You, You can't do it on your own. You might as well quit kidding yourself. Uh, You need uh, God and you need other people to help you get out of it. You're not ever going to get uh, well on your own. And once you have admitted uh, an area of temptation to a friend or support group, whatever, you're ready for step five, and that is avoid tempting situations. You know, it's just common sense, folks, that that if you hang around the barbershop long enough, you're eventually going to get a haircut. Um... It's just common sense. If you don't want to get stung, stay away from the bees. If you don't want to get burned, stay away from the fire. If you don't want to fall off a cliff, don't hang over the edge. The goal is not how close can I get to temptation and still not give in. The goal is how far can I keep away from it. Um, Look at this verse in Proverbs 14. A wise man turns away from evil, but a fool is arrogant and careless. The fool says, oh, I can handle this. Who are you kidding? You, you, you don't go to a bar just to eat pretzels. So you need to do a little frank assessment, and you need to analyze when and where I am most tempted. Where am I most vulnerable? And, and, and then real simple, stay away from those situations. 
as much as you can or minimize them. Um, where am I most tempted? Is it in airports? Is it on business trips? Is it at home when I'm alone and everyone else is out of the house? Is it after school? Is it on weekends? Is it when I'm watching television? Um, You need to be aware of the situations that cause you to stumble and then avoid those things. Just say, just stay away from them. Look at this next verse, Psalm 119, uh, 59. It says, I thought about the wrong direction in which I was headed and turned around and came running back to you. That's a good verse to carry in your wallet. I thought about. The Bible says to run from temptation. Flee it. If you have to physically remove yourself from it, do it. When Joseph, for example, was tempted by uh, Potiphar's wife, she was a married woman trying to seduce him. And, um, and it says he was wearing his favorite coat and she grabbed him by the coat and, and uh, he just left the coat and split. And sometimes you may have to leave your coat. But you get out of the situation. You run from it. You don't, you don't stay around. And when you're tempted, you change directions. Get out of there. Change the channel. Take a walk. Take a shower. (laughs) Call a Christian friend. Do something to break the spell. And here's some practical advice. Don't ever argue with the devil. You'll lose. You'll lose every time because he's had thousands of years to think up lines to counter anything you can come up with. So don't rationalize it. Don't justify it. Don't argue it. When you're being tempted, the key thing to do is to break the focus. You don't look at the cookies and say, I don't want them, I don't want them, I don't want them, I'm not hungry. No, you're kidding. Turn around and get out of there. Uh, the, the more you fight a feeling, the stronger it becomes in your life because you're, you're continually focusing on the things that you don't want. Avoid the situation. Ephesians 4.27 says, don't give the devil a foothold. And what that means is when temptation calls you on the phone, drop the receiver. Uh, It's okay to be rude to the devil. Just hang up and go do something else. And number six, affirm God's word. Um, Claim the promises that God has, has given in his word about temptation. And everybody else ought to remember, you know, Everybody ought to memorize 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way so you can stand up under it. And I've heard people say things like, well, you know, I just couldn't help myself. If you had been in that situation, you would have understood. It was... It was It was absolutely impossible to resist. I had no choice but to give in. And I usually say, well, yes, I I would understand. But are you calling God a liar? Are you you calling him a liar? You you say, well, I had no choice. I, I had to give in to that temptation. And while God says here, he will always make a way out. It may be tough, it may be difficult, it may be painful, it might even be embarrassing, but there will always be a way out. So you cannot legitimately say, I had no choice but to give in, because you did have a choice. God made sure of that. That is his promise. And Satan is constantly battling for your mind. That, that's where the battle happens, it's up here. And, and And as I said, when when God gives us an idea, it's an inspiration. When the devil gives us an idea, it's a temptation. And you are choosing every day which thoughts you are going to dwell on. Good thoughts or bad thoughts? God's thoughts or the devil's thoughts? And, And so you need to change your mind by replacing the temptation with truth. Where is truth? It's right here, right in this book. The Bible says you need to resist the devil. How do you do that? By preparing for temptation. Notice this verse in Ephesians 6.17. 
Accept salvation from God to be your helmet and receive the word of God to use as a sword. He's saying you have to be ready for battle. You you have to put on the proper armor and, and have the proper weapons. You see, some of you, when you go into battle of temptation, you don't have the proper armor on and, and uh, uh, proper weapons, and you are spiritual streakers, if you remember that phrase. And you go running out on the battlefield butt naked. And Satan's going, look at this. They're defenseless. They've got nothing. Now it says there are two things you need to do in order to handle temptation. Notice this. First, how do you prepare for war? For the battle in your mind? Salvation is the first step. Um, Accept salvation from God to be your helmet. What does a helmet do? It protects your mind. And when you put on a helmet, it protects your head. And that's where the battle is going on. And I want to tell you, before you can, can say no to the devil, you have to say yes to Jesus Christ. Because you have to have his power. That's called salvation. And I also want to say to you that if you've never opened up your mind to Jesus Christ, your heart and your mind, and said, come in and be my Lord and Savior, then you are absolutely defenseless against the devil. You have no weapons, no protection at all for evil thoughts, for ugly thoughts, for harmful thoughts. You don't have a chance of resisting him because you don't have the power if you don't have the helmet of salvation. So first of all, you need to invite Jesus Christ into your life and say, give me your power. And then number two, it says you need to receive his word uh, to use as a sword. Now, this is the antidote to temptation. Um, Truth is always the antidote. And this is your sword, the Bible. But the sword is worthless until you can, unless you can get it up here in your mind. I mean, you can have a Bible on your table at home, but when you're at work and you're tempted... What good is that going to do you? Nothing. Not, no good at all. And so you need to, to get somehow the truth of this book up here in your mind. And this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say today. Without a doubt, the single most effective tool in combating temptation is to memorize Scripture. Um, you need to get it in your brain. And if you have a problem with worry, you need to memorize uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 8. Don't worry about anything, but in everything with prayer, uh, let your request be made, made known to God, and, and uh, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And if you're having a problem accomplishing a task, you need to memorize Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you memorize some of those wonderful verses from Psalm 119, like, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. Or, or, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you don't have any verses memorized up here, you've got no bullets in your gun. And, and, And when the devil comes along and says, oh, come on, everybody's doing it. What are you going to counter with? See, he's not afraid of your opinion. But he does run from the truth. It is the sword that God has given to you. Um, And it only comes uh, effective, a sword, when you memorize it and you carry it with you. Uh, When Jesus was tempted in Matthew 3, uh, he, he turned around, every time he was tempted, he turned around and quoted what? Scripture. Uh, Why? To show us how to resist the devil. Uh, quote verses back. Get them in your heart and mind. If you, simply, if you simply memorize verses while you were waiting in traffic in Manila, you could probably have the whole Bible memorized in two weeks. I, you know, I, I, okay. Maybe, maybe not. But, uh, but, but set a goal. A, a verse a week. Or if that's too much, a verse a month. Uh, you could put little cards on your visor in your car, on your mirror in your bathroom or, or whatever, and um, every time uh, you come to a red light or um, uh, stop traffic, you, you flip that verse down, you read it. And if you read it about 10 times, you'll have it memorized. 
And you keep reading it until the guy behind you honks. And then you flip it up and go forward, okay? Um, Fill your mind with the word of God. Because it is the truth that sets you free. Not opinions, but the truth. Well, we started off with a letter that I read to you. Uh, Paul in Romans 7. I didn't finish the letter. I want to finish it now. Here's the rest of the story. Paul says this. First of all, he said, I tried everything, but nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? That's the real question. And then he says, the answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does help. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. And here's the good news. We no longer have to live under a continuous, low-lying, black cloud of condemnation. A new power is in operation. The spirit life in Christ has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with your problem as something remote or unimportant. In his son Jesus, he personally took on the human condition. He entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The answer is not a program. It is a person, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us the truth. You've given us the answer. You show us how clearly to defeat a temptation in our life and and, uh, how to live according to your word. Give us, Lord, the strength this day to apply this truth to our life, to apply your word to our life, to learn it, to memorize it, to use it whenever we are tempted. And that's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.